talk about the subject, is religion defining you? And I want to deal with the sacred cows of religion. <clears throat> because that's what they are. One verse in the book of Ecclesiastes I want to start with. It says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. There's the sacred cow. You cannot be complete or perfect before the Lord. Solomon said it. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. This is repeated in several places. In the New Testament, we have an example. If they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them and give them to an enemy, so that they are carried away captive to the land of the enemy, far off or near. Okay? Well, there it is again. For there is no one who does not sin. No one. Hmm. find something that verse is found in the book of Isaiah the prophet Isaiah 40 or 8, 46. And by the way, welcome to those this morning watching via the faith loop. We appreciate you. Didn't forget you. There it is. You cannot be perfect or without sin. Hmm. And that's one of the greatest deceptive creeds of religion is we are just sinners saved by grace and we're not capable of doing what is right. It's one of the greatest deceptions that they teach today. It's one of the sacred cows of all religion. You can't be. You just can't do it. In the Orthodox religions, such as Catholicism, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, and several, and several others, and Presbyterian, Lutheran, and so forth, you go every Sunday. Some people go every day. Real devouts go every day. And take communion. They go to confession. And this is the way they are absolved of the sin because you cannot be sinless. Baptize a baby. You mean to tell me that you're serving a God that is so unfeeling toward his people that he would cast a baby into hell if you didn't do this on his forehead with some water? Are you kidding me? You really believe that? Ain't no wonder people have turned away. That baby isn't, the baby don't know nothing. That baby, God's just. God is a just God. He always does what's right. You think he would condemn that baby to hell because it can't even talk, let alone think or decide for itself anything. I don't know who we think we're serving. I get, sometimes, it really uh, makes me wonder. We are taught these erroneous doctrines, which is just a teaching. A doctrine is a teaching. And why are they taught? Why do we teach this stuff? Why do they teach it? I don't teach it, but why do they teach it? They're excuses. They're just excuses. What are they excuses for? To keep us in a constant state of fear and dependency. Our salvation does not depend on the creeds of any religious body, but we think it does. 
They convince you that if you don't come and if you don't do this, if you don't do that, then we can't absolve you and you're, you're done for. Well, you don't absolve me in the first place. Jesus absolved. I want to look at a couple of words here today, and I'm taking my time because I want to be very plain. The word orthodoxy. We talk about orthodoxy. Now, it's not just used in the terms of the religions I mentioned, but orthodoxy is in every religious body. They have an orthodoxy. Because it just means correctness of opinion, especially in theology. Conformity to the church creeds, 1620s from French, and directly from late Latin, from late Greek, right opinion. Abstract noun, having the right opinion. Correct belief or opinion, orthodox. So who decides this correct belief and opinion? The Lord? The book? No, they do. Doesn't matter what the book says. It really doesn't. Because they're all different. So there's about 40,000 religious organizations listed in this country and around the world. And they're all different. So who's right? Some of their orthodoxy is different than the other. That's why they split. Methodist Church is now splitting because some have a different, different orthodoxy than the others. A different opinion. Okay? So it doesn't just mean Catholicism and the, one who's, and the ones who broke away such as Greek and Russian and so forth. All religious organizations or entities have a orthodoxy. Now, there's only a few that I know of that don't conform to Nicaea, the council that Constantine called. And they went to his summer home, and there the emperor of Rome, who was a pagan and died a pagan, a sun worshiper, never converted to Jesus, never did. Read your history for Pete's sake. And yet, many religions will tell you he did. Well, wait a minute then who's right? The history that we know is right? He never converted. No one, even some of the Christian, so-called Christian fathers, will tell you he never converted. So this pagan Roman emperor sits on a throne and decides what's going to be the truth of Christianity. He rejects all the Arians. And Ananathus, he comes up with this Trinity thing, and that's what and Constantine says, you believe this or I'll kill you. Believe this or die. It's, that's it. And yet his son, born after him who took the throne, was an Arian and did away with all what Constantine. And then they went right back to it. Until a few hundred years later, a church was born called Catholic which means universal. The universal church. See, and there's only one. They believe there's only one. It's the universal church. If you don't belong to it, you're not, you're not, you're just not going. You're just, you're, you've had it. Hmm. All right. I want to read out of the text John 8. The book of John Eighth chapter. And I want to read down at the, or the first verse through the eleventh, really. This is a story about something that took place. Now, to be completely open about this, there are biblical scholars that dispute this being in John's gospel. Even though they admit that it, it absolutely happened, but 
Some say it should have been in Luke's gospel, down about the 21st, at the end of the 21st chapter. Whether or not it's in Luke or John, who cares? It happened. See, we sit around and fight and fuss over this nonsense. Where was this? Where was that? Well, John didn't talk like that, and he didn't write this way, and he didn't use those kind of words, and that's what we all get into. John used these words, and he didn't use that word. Uh, in any, Well, why couldn't you use a different word? We do. Could you tell who I am by something I write to you? Unless I put my name up the top or signed it at the bottom? McClellan and Steer vehemently maintain it on both internal and external grounds. Edersheim says, and I'm reading out of the pulpit commentary, which is really good. Edersheim says that it, pre it presents insuperable difficulties in the un-Jewish account given of the accusers. Now what I mean by un-Jewish is that they didn't bring the man with them. Plus stoning was, according to Clark, when they would stone somebody like that, they would put them on a scaffold about 10 to 12 feet high, and the accusers would push her off really hard. And if she died from the fall, nothing else was done. If not, then somebody, one of the accusers would pick up a large stone and throw it on their chest. And that usually did the trick. And yet, here it's talking about they picked up stones. To stone her. Well, that's not. And Clark says, well, yeah, but I can show you places where they did use stones and they picked up stones and everything else. So, see, we fight over semantics. Foolishness. Unjewish. Unjewish, my eye. They didn't throw Stephen off of a scaffold. They stoned him to death. When they tried to stone Jesus, they picked up stones, the Bible says. Okay. He says, the witnesses, the public ex examination, the bringing of the woman to Jesus, and the punishment claimed. He says, Renan and Farrar have made very powerful biographic use of the narrative. So many say the reason the passage was left out was because they, now listen to this. There are those that think this passage was left out simply because it would give license to adultery because Jesus acquitted it. I was in a, a meeting in Tucson, Arizona in a, ministering to a congregation there and I mentioned in the service one night, I mentioned in my message about Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of his time. His church was immense and it was packed. You couldn't get into a Spurgeon service. They gathered from everywhere to come and hear Charles Spurgeon. He was so famous, they used his name in advertising. But he smoked cigars. And I mentioned that. They asked him one time if he thought it was wrong. And he said, no, not unless you do it to excess. And they said, what do you consider excess? He said, two at a time. <laughs> well, I said that that night. The pastor come afterwards and he said, my God, Bob, why would you say that? You give my people license to go smoke and do it. I said, well, is it the truth? They can't read Spurgeon? They can't go get the book and read it to them? We're scared to death that we're going to give somebody license. And that's what they were afraid of. So they actually thought it would give people license because Jesus seemed to have acquitted an adulterous woman. So <laughs> adultery is okay. That's how ignorant it gets. Or he was condoning it.
the passage in, in the pulpit, the passage was undoubtedly admitted as part of the gospel by both Jerome, Augustine, and Ambrose, and many later fathers of the Western Church. Jerome did not discard it from the Vulgate version and distinctly says that it was found in Multus, uh, and he gives some Latin terms here, and that it was read on the feast of St. Pelagia, Ambrose quoted from it and reproached those who made a bad use of it. Augustine admits that some were afraid of the passage. Listen, Augustine admits that some were afraid of the passage lest it should lead to laxity of morals and so had erased it from their condices. Augustine comments on it, on it in verse by verse and preached from several texts found in it. By his own admission, he said they just left it out because they were Afraid it would lead to the laxity of morals. So let's don't, let's don't tell the truth. Dear God, why would we tell the truth? Why would we just say things that are true? You can't do that. You've got to keep stuff back. You've got to lie, cheat, and steal. So we can hold these people in bondage to us. Or in bondage to something that doesn't, really isn't a bondage. So there's a New Testament example of what we're talking about. And you know, it's strange how we think about things. And Clark on this verse, he that is without sin, he has no sin, the verse says. It's in the eighth verse, and I don't know, something happened to my notes and I lost the... Uh, it's, you're going to read John 1 through 11? Are you gonna yeah, it's the eighth verse, that's right. One of those white hair moments. In the eighth verse, John says, or the seventh verse, and as they continued to ask him, this is the story, he stood up and said to them, let, who, who, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. It's the woman they brought to him caught in the act of adultery as you I haven't read the whole thing here, but that's what it is. He that has no sin, see, you, you can't live without sin. They all walked away, so they had to be sinners. Even though they were the top Pharisees, he that hath no sin. Well, you can't say that. Really. But him who is without sin among you, be the first to throw a stone at her. And that's actually what it is a better translation than King James. Can't sin. Okay. Clark on this verse says something really interesting. He that is without sin, meaning the same kind of sin, adultery, fornication. Kype has largely proved that the verb is used in this uh, in this sense, by the best Greek writers. And I, I went and looked at it. I'm not going to go into all of that. But I went and looked at it. And uh, I looked at the usage of it and so forth. And it's pretty, uh, pretty correct. What he accused them of, he said, you that haven't committed adultery or fornication, you throw the first stone at her. Boy, that, that, that brought it right down to home. He wasn't talking about just any sin. Which one of you haven't missed the mark? You stand around holy and pray long prayers that you might be seen and heard of men. You do all these things and yet when Jesus actually put it to them, they had to walk away. At least their conscience wasn't totally gone.
But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with a woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. And from now on, sin no more. He didn't condone it. He said, Don't do it anymore. Quit. Stop it. Regarding this, Clark says some interesting stuff. Listen to this. The patience and meekness exercised by our Lord towards his most fell and unrelenting enemies are worthy of the special regard of all that who are persecuted for righteousness. That word fell, you know, we think of fell as just fallen down, right? No, no. It means cruel, barbarous, or inhuman. It seemed fury, discord, madness fell. Fierce, savage, ravenous, bloody, or more fell than tigers on the Libyan plain. That's what it used to mean in Old English. Fell. And that's what Clark uses here. Because he wrote in about 1843, somewhere in there. Towards his most fell, barbarous, cruel, filled with fury, unrelenting enemies. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. As the searcher of hearts, he simply declared their state. He does that in the, eight, in the 44th verse of that chapter. In order to their conviction and conversion, not to have done so would have been to betray their souls in this part of his conduct. We find two grand virtues united, which are rarely associated in man, meekness and fidelity. Patience to bear all insults and personal injuries and boldness in the face of persecution and death to declare the truth. The meek man generally leaves the sinner unreproved. The bold and zealous man often betrays a want of due self-management and reproves sin in a spirit which prevents the reproof from reaching the heart. In other words, we just rail on them. Beat them down. You lousy, no good sinner. And in reproof from teaching the heart. In this respect also our blessed Lord has left us an example that we should follow his steps. Let him that reads understand, Clark says. He used something out of the scripture that Jesus always used. Now listen to this. I know it's a little long but, and I could just say some of it. But I want to read it to you because it, it has more meaning if you, if you read it. The case of the woman taken in adultery when properly and candidly considered is both intelligible and edifying. It is likely that the accusation was well founded. The reason I think they didn't bring the man with them in the un-Jewish way was they were trying to trap him. They weren't worried about Jewish law, ritual, or nothing. They were trying to trap him into doing something that they might charge him. It is likely that the accusation was well founded and that the scribes and Pharisees endeavored maliciously to serve themselves of the fact to embroil our Lord with the civil power or ruin his moral reputation. Now remember that with the civil power. Our Lord was no magistrate and therefore could not with any propriety give judgment in the case. He was not a Roman magistrate or a Jewish one for that matter. Had he done it, it must have been considered an invasion of the rights and office of the civil magistrate and would have afforded them ground for a process against him. You don't think he wasn't wise, you're wrong. On the other hand, had he acquitted the woman he might have been considered not only as a setting aside the law of Moses, but as being indulgent to a crime of great moral turpitude, and the report of this must have ruined his moral character. He disappointed this malice by refusing to enter into the case. 
And why, are you, why am I saying this? Because, see, we do the same thing today with politics. We think politics is going to solve the problem. So we get political. God's going to give us a, 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 an anointed president. And uh, Trump is the anointed of the Lord. And God's going to... No, 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 no. Come on. Listen now. He disappointed this malice by refusing to enter into the case and overwhelmed his adversaries with confusion by unmasking their hearts and pointing out their private abominations. It is generally supposed that our Lord acquitted the woman. This is incorrect. He neither acquitted nor condemned her. He did not enter at all jurisdictionally into the business. His saying, neither do I condemn thee, was no more than a simple declaration that he would not concern himself with the matter. That being the, uh, that being the office of the chief magistrate, but as a preacher of righteousness, he exhorted her to abandon her evil practices, lest the punishment which she was now likely to escape should be inflicted on her for a repetition of her transgression. Sharp. They couldn't trap him any way they tried. He neither acquitted her nor condemned her. And he said, I'm not going to get into your Jewish law on this. You're lawyers. You're the, you're the Jewish lawyers. You do it. Let you, this without sin, cast the first stone at her. You throw the first stone. Maybe we ought to check into your backgrounds. Hmm. In Ezekiel 18.4, Behold, all souls are mine as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that, soul that sins, it shall die, right? There you are. Soul that sins. I got a lot of notes here, so bear with me just a moment. So when you get into some of the definitions here and the way these verses are uh, constructed, you find something different. Everybody sins. You can't not sin. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And so on and so forth. So you can't live above that. But Adam Clark goes into this in detail. And what he comes up with is very, very interesting because of the way these things are translated. The way they're translated. In the, the King James is at best iffy at times. So here's Adam Clark. And I want to, I want to, I'm trying to make it as pointed as I can make it. On the 8th verse and the 8th, 7th, the 7th verse, he says, as I said, meaning the same kind. And let him cast the first stone. But it also talks about, he also talks about how that the verse is constructed. It doesn't say anything like what we see it read. What it means is, 
and has it, if you translate it out of the Greek, it means that they have the ability or you have the, the, uh, oh, what's the word I want? You can, you can sin, but it's, I, I, the words fail me, but you have, you might do it. That's what it's talking about. You might sin. You could sin, but it's not saying that you do. It's saying you might. If any man sin, he might, but it doesn't mean he's going to. It doesn't mean what they're talking about. You go to 1 John 5.18. The little Johns over in the New Testament. First John at the 5th chapter and the 18th verse. Look at this. It says, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. He who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. Now, wait a minute. Amen. He that's born of God does not keep on sinning. Amen. Now, that's a contradiction. Okay? First John 3, 8, look at this. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. And we don't read those verses very often, do we? Well, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Well, then you're, you're lost. Then you're not, you're not born again. Or you're not trying very hard. Now, I say, well, you know, everybody makes mistakes. Yeah, we do. But we don't deliberately go out and commit sin. Clark on this verse says something interesting. Hear this also. Ye who plead for bail and cannot bear the thought of that practice that states believers are to be saved from all sin in this life. He who commits sin is a child of the devil and shows that he is still, he has, uh, that he has still the nature of the devil in him. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. He was the father of sin, brought sin into the world, and maintained sin in the world by living in the hearts of his own children. And thus leading them to transgression and persuading others that they cannot be saved from their sins in this life. Oh, come on. Amen. That he may secure, listen, now listen, that he may secure a continual residence in their heart. He knows that if he has a place there throughout life, he will probably have it at death. And if so, thoroughly throughout eternity. Hmm. Well, I thought we couldn't. You know, you can't live without sin, really. What's these verses saying then? Ezekiel 18, 4. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. Well, wait a minute. If, I, if, my, if, if my being, if my person is sinful, then death is awaiting me. Eternal death. Even Ezekiel knew that. As I said, Clark said, he might sin, but doesn't have to. In other words, we might, but not necessarily. In other words, the temptation is always there. We don't get away from that because we're still living in this world. The temptations are always, Jesus was tempted in like manner as we are. In other words, in every way that we're tempted, he was tempted. But he said, no, I ain't going to do it. So tell me then that we can't live 
a sinless life. If we don't, then we got problems. If we don't, we have problems, folks. So, (laughs) one of the sacred cows, as I said, of religion is this idea that we can't live above sin. Now I want to go back to Ecclesiastes 7.20 and I want to deal with that a little bit again. I know I'm having to go in my e-sword here quite a bit, but uh, bear with me. It's necessary. Okay, surely there's not a righteous man on earth and good who never sins. There it is. There it is. You can't, you can't do it. Yeah. As one southern pastor says from Georgia, Listen to what Clark says about this. Now here, he, you know the verse, he says, but he gives the Hebrew here. Lo yekta in Hebrew. He says, that may not sin. There is not a man upon earth, however just he may be, and habituated to do good, but is peccable, liable to commit sin, and therefore should continually watch and pray. That's what it's saying. That's what it says. Liable, maybe. Yeah, it's, we can do it. If it's put in front of our face and we say, okay, then that's on us. But Paul says, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. In other words, if we do fall to temptation, we can go to the Father and say, hey, straighten me out. I need to straighten up here. And God's gracious to forgive. But just to say that we cannot do this is absolutely wrong. And yet that's one of the sacred cows of religion. You can't do it. So that keeps us dependent on them. Keeps us going back every Sunday getting that juice and cracker. You know, the the Romans called the Christians cannibals. Because they got the idea too that they were eating the body of Jesus. Well, wait a minute. And you eat that bread and it literally becomes the flesh of Jesus Christ. Well, how many wafers have been consumed from the time they begin to do that until now? Jesus must have had a big body. Because man, they're still still taking slices out of him. And we drink the wine and it turns into blood. Well, Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body. This wine, this cup is my blood. Yeah, I know. I got a book over there on that. I'm not going to go into it today, but you can read it. (laughs) This is my body. The terms were used metaphorically. I am, he said, the bread of life. I am the bread of life. I am. Well, how did he give us the bread of life? Right here. If Jesus would have come and sat around and said nothing, we wouldn't know anything. He just sat there like a knot on a log. Just sat there. Is your name Jesus? What would you come to do? Were you going to tell us anything? Bye. How did he convey himself to us? How did he convey the Father to us? With his words. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Believe what I'm saying. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, to the people. Listen, hear, understand. That's how he conveyed himself. 
So as I partake of that word, I partake of his body. Not by some cracker I eat. You can eat all the saltine crackers in the world or all them blessed holy wafers. Or, you know, in the Catholic Church, there was a time where if you dropped the communion on the ground, it was a penalty of death. They would kill you. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Jesus said, if, if they drop you, kill them. Just kill them. Where did Jesus ever say to kill people that do things like this? Where did Jesus ever say, kill those heretics that don't agree with you or they're heretics, just go out and kill them? Where's that in the scripture? I know Jesus said, go on over and preach the gospel. I know he said, love your enemies. I know he said, forgive those that have debt against you. Not one time did he ever say, kill them. And yet, the Catholic Church killed more people than you can shake a stick at. Because just simply because they disagreed with them. Look at the Spanish Inquisition. Go read about it. Go read. <laughs> and yet then on the other side, the Catholic priest will tell you that we, we had to be in hidey holes because we had to keep ourselves uh, hid from the, from the uh, Protestant uh, uh, maniacals out there wanting to kill us. Well, yeah, they killed back and forth. So the Protestants weren't any better. They did the same thing. And they, but the, we, we're supposed to have the, no, 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 no. John Calvin had 58 people put to death simply because they didn't agree with him or they broke his law. And then he stood back and said, well, it wasn't really me. It was the civil government. Yeah, well, who told the civil government what to do, John? You did. Do you know it was against the law not to attend Sunday service? In most of those cities, it was against the law. You went or you suffered punishment. Oh, yeah. It was against the law. You are going to do this. You're going to do it. <laughs> See, we don't read any history. We don't know the history of these things. And so we sit around blindly and just eat juice, drink juice and eat crackers and, and make signs over ourselves. And, and in the Protestant church, we do the same thing. Same thing. Still Nicaea. But claim that, oh, we're, we're holy because we reject that. We don't have a pope. Well, good. <laughs> yeah, we do. We got a lot of popes in pulpits around the world that people nearly worship. That's what Paul said. He said, how come one of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas? What about Jesus? Did you forget him? I don't want any Frenchites around. I want some Jesusites. Don't follow Bob French. Follow the one I'm talking about. Follow him who called us. That's what I'm doing. I'm trying my best to follow him. You do your best to follow him. That's what I'm trying to teach you today. Don't follow a man. Follow Jesus. Amen. Don't fall for religious nonsense. And let that define you as a person or a Christian. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ask somebody what they are. And the first thing they will tell you is the denomination of their faith. They won't say I'm a born again Christian. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. They don't say that. I'm a Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Greek Orthodox. Huh? I'm a Coptic. That's what they say. Okay. What's that mean? <laughs> All right. You're a Lutheran. What's that mean? You're a Presbyterian. Unless I know the tenets of that particular religion, I don't know what you mean. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you believe. Unless I go read their tenets. I know some of them. I've read them. You go into a Lutheran church. Set up just like the Catholic church. Got the altar. Got the two men standing on each side in their robes. And the big altars got the communion on it and you do the same thing. We just don't believe in the Pope. The Pope, oh, okay. So if you get rid of, this is what Martin Luther did. He said if we get rid of the Pope, this would really be the true church. 
Adam Clark said that. Even though I like him as a, as a uh, theological scholar, he said the same thing. He said if we just get rid of the Pope and some of the damnable things that they're doing, then it would be the true church. Okay. I don't know how many saints they have. We don't pray to the saints. I've asked so many Catholics. We don't pray to saints. You don't? Well, how come? Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. That's not a prayer? Mary's dead. She's still dead. She'll be raised, I think, and be with the Lord, but she's dead now. Been dead a long time. Oh, but we saw her on the garage door. Thousands of people come burning candles and bound down, almost burning people's house down, trying to light candles around there. Oh, did you see the statue cried? Blood ran out of its eyes. Oh, my God. But we don't pray to idols. We don't pray to saints. Really. Hmm. What is that then? Is that not a prayer? You're asking Mary to pray for you. That's a prayer. So you can't pray for yourself. You can't go directly to the Father and say, Father, I want to talk to you today. No, you have to go to Mary and ask him to do it. One priest said this. He said, all you, he, they, see, they believe Jesus is, is, is mean and nasty. He's hateful. And you have to appease him. See, that comes from the pagan gods, the idea of the pagan gods. The reason you sacrificed to Zeus was to appease him, keep him off your case so he don't kill you. That's what they did. They sacrificed to these gods to appease them. Well, what are we trying to do? One priest said, all you have to do, all you have to do is show Jesus the paps that he sucked and his wrath subsides. In other words, if I can see my mother's paps if you don't know what that means, I'm not going to say any more. Then that will subside and ease his anger. Because he's angry. Where does it say that? Where in the book does it say that? Where in the Bible does it say that? Anywhere near it. They came to Jesus one day and said, Behold your mother and your your brothers and your sisters. And he said, who is my mother? And who are my brothers and my sisters? Those that do the will of my father. Oh, wait a minute. Now, he didn't ever deny her. At, at, on the cross, he looked down and said, John, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. In other words, John, take care of her. Take care of her. It's not that. But we get this idea, see, that, and then, see, the ascension of Mary into heaven, that didn't become a doctrine until the 1950s. Did you know that? Till the 1950s. Finally, we decided she ascended into heaven just like Jesus. She didn't die. She ascended into heaven, and she sits there. And every, anytime you see Jesus in a Catholic church, you'll see Mary above him with all this bright light and everything. She's exalted above Jesus. Well, she didn't die for me. She didn't live for me. And I said that because that's what most people believe. She didn't live for me. She brought her child into the world. Was she blessed? Yes. Did the father, you know, pick her out as something special? Yeah. But she wasn't to be worshipped. So where do we get all these ideas about these things? And all of them are different. They're all different. The biggest deception that the enemy ever perpetrated on mankind was religion. Because you think you're okay and you're not. If I want to deceive you, see, 
How many times have I said it? You look at Cuba, you look at any country, you look at any nation. What are they saying right now about America? You'll own nothing, but you'll be blessed and happy. They're promising you peace and joy and contentment and goodness. And what they're really going to do, if they get their way, is take everything you got away from you. Go look at Cuba. Take a trip down there and look at it. It's a hole. It's a pit. But do you think Castro and his brother Raul lived that way? No, they lived in these mansions they stole from the people that earned them and worked for them. You think they're doing with that? You think that the government's worrying about the price of gas? No, because you're, they're using your tax money to buy it. They don't care. So what? Who cares? You think they're worried about you? Your problems? We just got a rent increase. And they cited inflation. Well, it's a 15.9% right now. I heard that yesterday. Getting up there where Carter in the Carter years. And so they cited inflation to raise our rent, okay? But I wonder, say, say for some reason another politician did get elected and brought the inflation level down. You think they'd come and write me a letter and say, we're going to drop the your, drop your rent back to where it was because inflation's at a better level? You think they're going to do that? It's an excuse. That's all it is. It's just an excuse to gouge you a little further. They promise you peace. They promise you joy. But when they come to power, it's the exact opposite. And we're that stupid to fall for it. I told somebody yesterday, I said, man don't want to be, he don't want to have any liberties. Man doesn't really want to be free or have any liberty. He doesn't. Because he keeps voting and he keeps asking for the things that take it away from him. It always amazes me. It always amazes me. We ask for the very thing that will destroy us. Religion is the same thing. It was a deception, a great deception. If you want to fool somebody, you get close to the truth. But you change it just a little where it messes them up. You've heard me say this. When they train treasury agents to look at counterfeit money, they never show them a fake bill. They never show them a counterfeit bill. Ever. They only study the real one. So when they see a, a one that isn't real or a counterfeit bill, they spot it immediately because they know that shouldn't be there. That isn't right. See, we study everything else but Jesus. Well, study him. Look at Jesus and find out who he is and then when you look around, you'll see what's right and wrong. Instead of some religious dogma. See, you have to, if I want, if I, for instance, and you've heard me say this, if I was a narc, if I was a drug cop, and I walked into a, an area where they're dealing and all that mess, and I was dressed in a suit and a tie and had a badge on, how long do you think I would last? So what's narcs do? <laughs> they, they get scroungy, they wear scroungy clothes, they act like them, they look like them, they go in there. If you want to infiltrate the mob, you better get an Italian accent and you better talk like them. So you can't fool somebody by being completely different. You have to be like it, close. Close, but leave the truth out. That's what the enemy did with religion. He made it so close. He made it look so good. That's what the Pharisees did. And what Jesus said to them, you've heard us say it ad nauseum. You are of your father the devil, he said to them that day. These were the leaders of Jewish law, of government. They were the highest religious order there was. He said, you're of your father. They said, Abraham's our father. He said, no, you're of your father the devil and his lust you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And a liar. And that's what he was calling them. Another place he said, you won't go in. Neither will you let them go in. See, they won't go in and they're not going to let you either. 
They won't enter into the truth and they're not going to let you because it's too lucrative. They're worth more money than governments of the world in actual wealth. Gold, silver, artifacts. You can't believe their wealth. They're just wealthy. This method of split, the main church is paying the ones that split $24 million to split from the men. Go read it. They're paying it to them. for what? I forget the reason, but they're paying it to the to people that are spending $24 million. Where do you get $24 million? Do you know the Assemblies of God? That's a Pentecostal group, right? Assemblies of God are one of the largest land uh, uh, holders in this country. In this country. They own more land than you can imagine. They, by their own admission, only send 10 cents on the dollar of all mission money they receive. 10 cents on the dollar. The rest of it goes to administration. Yeah, some salary, somebody's pocket. I know this isn't a jump up and down shout sermon. I know it isn't, you know. But it's something we need to understand. I don't worship the God of religion. I worship Jehovah the God of life and blessing. I accept his son for who he is. I am a born again believer in Jesus Christ. I'm not Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran. My neighbor, I've told you the story, my neighbor, when I moved in years ago, he come out, he's introduced himself and everything, and he said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a minister. And he said, what faith? I said, none. I said, just the faith of Jesus. Well, what religion are you? I said, I don't believe in religion. He stepped back and he looked at me. He said, you're a minister and you don't believe in religion? I said, no, sir, I don't. I believe in Jesus. He couldn't grasp it. What do you mean you don't believe in religion? You're a minister. You got to believe in a religion. No, I don't. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the truth. I believe in the words he said. I believe in what he talked about. And I try to do that. And don't tell me you can't do it because he said you could. Yeah, is there a possibility that we might sin? Sure. But you don't have to. Come on, amen. When, the, when it's put there before you, don't do it. That's all. Just don't do it. Decide not to. It's just like, you know, I, I don't eat sugar. My, I'll take my blood sugar before I eat my evening meal in the 90s. The other, night, the other day it was 90, 98, 96. Well, they had me on medication. I'm not on it now. You know why? Because I don't eat what I shouldn't eat. Now, once in a while, I'll do it, and my blood sugar will go up. I said, well, see, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. But it's my choice. But see, I was, I was kidding with Steph this morning. She had that, them donuts back there, and there was an old-fashioned in there, an old-fashioned buttermilk donut, my favorite donut in the world. I love them things. And she said, what if you, you wanted that? I said, no, no, because I know what it'll do to me. I can't do it. So I don't. Don't tell me you can't. Can't never did anything but want. Just want. My dad commits so quit smoking cigarettes like that. Just quit. One day he just he smoked four packs of camels a day. And non filtered. He just quit. He walked in the house one day. Dad drank about a fifth of whiskey every day of his life that I remember, that he could get it. Not all at once, but throughout the day, you know. He kind of stayed just kind of you know, feeling good. Walked in the house one day and looked at my mother and said, Helen, I'm never going to drink again. And he quit. You can't do it. Yeah, he did. Don't tell me you can't. Can't nothing. Yeah, you can I just can't, I'm, I'm a sinner, I can't. Yet, no, if you're a sinner, then you're not saved. You're not born again. I know you're not, you're not born again. Or you're on the road to not being born again. Somebody said, well, you can't, now, as many of the religions say, you can't lose your salvation. Once saved, 
always saved, then why are the ten virgins? They were all virgins. All of them. Ten virgins, not ten maybe. Didn't say there were five virgins and five that were so-so. We don't know. Said ten virgins, but five of them lost their oil. And when the bridegroom came, they didn't go. How come? They were all virgins. We don't read that scripture? No, because we have a doctrine. We have a dogma that says, bless God, once you're saved, always saved. Hang what the Bible says. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. So we're not saved yet. We're still here. See, if I'm saved from an accident, that means either it didn't happen, I avoided it, or I got out of it alive. See, I'm not saved till it happens. You save somebody out of a burning house, unless that house is burning, you can't save them. <laughs> so why do we always worry? I'm saved. I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, you're not saved yet. You're on the road. Yes, and you better get to the end of it the same way you started. Amen. See, no, in no other area of life do we talk like that. And you've heard me. I know I... I hate to use the examples over and over, but nowhere else do we talk like that. Nowhere. Can you ride a bike? Yeah. Well, I don't know. You ever rode one? Yeah. Can you still ride it? I don't know. I'd probably fall over. You know, I'm just a, I'm just a wreck. <laughs> Can you drive a car? No, I forgot. <laughs> you better drive. Well, maybe he forgot too. I don't know. Can't do anything. We just can't, you know. Can you do this job? No, I don't know anything about that job. In fact, I'm stupid, but I want you to hire me anyway. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. And sometimes in, in the atmosphere we're living in today, I saw Stephen laugh, in the atmosphere we're living in today, sometimes you do because it's all you can get. <laughs> said, my God, it's, you know, we put a body out there one way or the other. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. In everything except our faith, we can do it. And we get egotistical about it. I can do that. I'm, I'm good. I can shoot. I can hit a bullseye. Ten out of ten. Okay. I can do, I can, we're, we're, we're sure about everything else we can do. And yet when it comes to our salvation... We don't know. Well, I'm, I'm hanging in there. Oh, my God. It's a hard walk. It's a hard battle. But the Lord helps me. You know, I'm just a sinner. I can't help it. In no other area of life do we do that except our religion. And we do it because it keeps us bound to it. Jesus said, he come to set us free. Oh, free from what? I'm not bound to that mess anymore. I'm not bound to Judaism, not bound to Catholicism, not bound to any of the isms. I'm bound to him. And in him, I'm free. I'm free from the law of sin and death. I have been given life. I've been given life. Amen? And so, when we look at the sacred cows, look at them for what they are. They're a man-made deception that builds religious kingdoms that people belong to that make them rich. Do you realize that today, right now, even in Pentecostal congregations, which are the full gospel fringe area out there that everybody, you know, says, oh my God, they're, they're way out there. If you sign a membership card, they will tell you you have to pay tithes or you can't be a member. You have to. 
it's required. The Mormon church for years, if you work in Utah and you're a Mormon, they will take it out of your check. Take it right out of your check. Do you say the Catholic Church does it too? Yes. They'll, they'll do it, and if you're, if you're not paying it and you want your kids to go to school, they ain't going because it's going to come right out of your check, and they're going to make sure they get it. But it's not for the school, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mandatory. Then what's it about? Peter walks up to the man at the gate of the temple. He's crippled. He's lame. He's laying there. Been lame all his life. He's a beggar. And he begs alms of Peter. Can you help me? Give me a penny. Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold. But what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And the man leaped. And he leaped running through the temple praising God. Not a matter of money. When Elijah was offered money for Naaman's healing, Naaman brought all this money, mules, loads of garments, silver, gold, everything. And Elijah is come. He wouldn't even come out of his house. He just stayed in the house. And it made the guy mad because he said, well, you won't even go out and talk to me. He, t- he told his servants to go out and tell him if he'll dip in the Jordan seven times, he'll be whole. Naaman's, Naaman's re- re- remark by that, about that was, well, I have clean rivers in my own life. I've been in the Jordan River. I've stood in that sucker, and it's not clean. There's bed springs, all kinds of crap. Later. You, have to, you have to wear shoes because it's liable to cut yourself up. He said, I've got clean rivers in my own country. Why couldn't I go there and do it? No, I want you, I told you, in the Jordan. Finally, Naaman gets mad, you know, because the guy won't even come out of the house. Well, that's an insult right there. I'm a prince in my country. You won't even come out and talk to me. Send your servant out here. Go tell him to live in the Jordan seven times if he wants to get rid of the leprosy. I brought all this money here. Elijah says, is, is it a day to receive money? This isn't about money. Finally, one of his servants talked him into it and he go down and dipped in the Jordan. Seven times he come up, he was clean. No leprosy. He goes back and offers Elijah all this that he brought. And Elijah said, no, it's not a day to take money. But the servant of Elijah, he goes and runs after him. He says, I know my master. He's, a, he's an austere man, but you know, I'll take a little. So he gave him some stuff. And he goes back and Elijah meets him. And he says, why'd you do that? He said, you had to be careful around prophets. They just knew stuff. <laughs> and what they said would happen. <laughs> Elijah said, because you did that, Naaman's leprosy is now yours. And he went out white as snow. Is that what it's about? I realize it, t- it takes money. I've got a plate over there. If you want to give, you can give. If you don't, then we'll close up and go somewhere else. And I'll be out, I'll, I'll do it in my, on the street. I don't care. It's not a matter of that. Yeah, it takes money to, it, you know, as I've said, the water's free, but the pipes cost money. I understand that. But that isn't what this is about. It's about you. It's about me. It's about people. Yes, I like, to, it's nice to have, we have a place to meet, we can come together. And the early church had places to meet, they came together. It was the assembly. But there were no church buildings for 300 years after Christ. What we'd call a church building, there wasn't any. Jesus never built a synagogue. He didn't build a temple. He could have, but he didn't. Why didn't he? He said, the foxes have old birds here of nests. I don't have a place to even lay my head. He didn't even have a house. What was he trying to tell us? Abraham said, here I have no continuing city. I'm a stranger walking through the land looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Dear Lord, if Abraham could have seen it in his day, why can't we see it? 
I'm not saying you ought to move out of your house and live on the street. That's not the point. The point is, it's not what it's about. Don't be deceived. Don't be in the deception of the sacred cows of religion. You can live as the Lord told you to live. And we need to do that. Sinless lives, complete in Him, walking as He intended us to walk. Is the possibility there? Yeah. Could we? Yeah. But don't. Make the decision. Just don't. No, I ain't going to do that today. I'm not going to do that. Not going to do it. Amen. All right. Uh, I hope I didn't stumble around too much or but it's a, it's a, I'm trying to condense it because it's a large subject to deal with. And I know I've taken a little time here this morning. But it's, it's a large subject to deal with. And so I tried to condense it down into just things that we would understand and to make it uh, easy understood. And I went into a lot of things. I understand that. But these scriptures that you see here, it doesn't say what you think it says. It says you may, you have the opportunity but don't. Because if you do, it's death. It's just death. Well, if I do make a mistake, can, yeah, you can come to the Lord and say, Father, forgive me. I, I, I stepped, made a wrong step. He'll forgive you. But don't do it again. Just like the woman caught in the door. She made a wrong step, yeah. He said to her, don't do it anymore. It's simple as that. Just don't do it. What's hard? It's like a guy went to the doctor and said, Doc, it hurts when I do this. The doctor said, don't do it anymore. It'll quit hurting. <laughs> simple, isn't it? It's simple. All right, anything? Questions, comments? Disagree, agree? <laughs> well, the first time that this ever happened was with Cain. They went right to Cain. The Lord says, what's wrong, Cain? Why are you so downcast? Sin is crouching at your door, but don't let it come in what? because of what it will produce. Fight it, Cain. Don't allow it. Don't do it. Don't do it. But he did it. And look what happened. He caused a mess, didn't he? He caused a mess. He killed his brother. See, we it may seem it may seem very simple. It may seem very, oh, you know, I can probably do that. It won't hurt it. But it causes it causes destruction, like we cannot believe. It will. It'll cause you destruction. But see, if you know to do it, and you do it anyway, you know not to do it, and you do it anyway. You're gonna be the same. See, I don't consider me personally, my personal opinion, I don't consider that a mistake. Mistakes are, mm -hmm. I think, more unintentional. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I made a mistake. Oh. Mm -hmm. But when you intentionally do something, mm -hmm. different story. When you know not to do it. And you do it anyway. Yep. Sin is crouching at your door. Right. You better understand how you are to deal with this. Right. And I how agree. to discipline your mind into saying no. And he didn't he didn't tell him that it was gonna overtake him, that he couldn't avoid it, and this is this is what you do when it does overtake you, this is what you do. It's not what he said. No. What he said was sin is crouching at your door, it desires to have you. To have you. But you must rule over it. That's what the Lord said to Cain. Yeah. Take authority over your Take own, authority own, own self, your own mind, your own body. That's right. Take by what you know. Mm -hmm. By what you know. That's right. Why did they have all these sacrifices? What did you do? Why did they have all these sacrifices? The sacrifice of the lamb and the this and the that. Oh, the Jews. Yeah. That's, a, that's a big subject. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to put it really... In the simplest terms I can put it, is, is the law came and all that came because they wouldn't obey the truth. Right. So they were given law because of transgression. Mm -hmm. The simplest way to understand that is if everybody in, the, in America did what was right, would we need law? No. They wouldn't do what was right. So God gave them a law. So you asked for it, you did. This was God given law. But they sacrificed these animals? Yeah. And they got to the place where they thought, just like we do with the communion or anything else, 
As long as I sacrifice the animal, I can be in anywhere I want to be. And the Lord said, in Isaiah, the first chapter of Isaiah, God said, I'm up to here. Yeah. Away with your sacrifices and your new moons and your Sabbaths. I don't want them anymore. I'm full. I'm full of the blood of bulls and goats. You don't know what you're doing. Take, get away from me. Because they believed that that was their salvation. And it wasn't. See, But law is given because men won't, won't quit being lawbreakers. That's why we have law. Because we won't stop law breaking it. Israel was given a chance under the time of the judges to live according as they should. Didn't do it. Didn't do it. And so the, the, one, of the, one of the things that the Lord did then was institute, okay, because of, because of your transgressions now, you ask for it, I'm going to give you a law. See if you can do that. And they couldn't do that. And then they transposed, just like we do, as long as I take communion, I'm okay. No matter what I do, I'm okay. Because, you know, and then if I, if I mess up, which I'm going to, <laughs> in our minds, you know, we, yeah, I'm going. But then I can go back on Sunday and take communion again, tell the priest what I did. And I'm okay. He'll absolve me. I can say 40 Hail Marys and two Our Fathers and I'm done. I think there's a lot that don't go to church on Easter Sunday that you're not in. Is that right? Please if you don't go to church on Easter Sunday, it's against the, it's against the Catholic religion. If you don't, you're in, you're, actually it's a mortal sin. Oh, yeah. It's a right. mortal sin any Sunday. <laughs> That's true. Well, that any is true. Sunday. Yeah, I guess it's more of a moral sin on Easter. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but the Easter was. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's why Sunday. the church is packed on Easter. Oh, yeah. I haven't been there in a long time. Oh, no. That's Easter why we go in two years. You Easter were, and Christmas. You were a CE woman, Christmas and Easter. CEOs, Christmas and Easter. Oh, yeah. That's right. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. right. Wow. And. Here's, even look at this. This is really simple. And it, you know, it's not that it's just bad. I don't mean it. But look how simple this is. And it, but it, it leads to part of the deception. Jesus was in the earth, in the ground, in the tomb, three days and three nights, right? That's what the book says. Friday night. Saturday night. Saturday night, Sunday. How many days is that? He got up early on the first day of the week, which was a Sunday. Yes. Yeah. And he was already risen, so he was in the ground one night. The Jews had special Sabbaths. Special. That week, on that Thursday, there was a special Sabbath. They crucified him on Wednesday. And they had to take him down because this special Sabbath was coming. And you couldn't leave any dead bodies laying around on a Sabbath. So they took him down. He was in the ground Wednesday night, Thursday day, Thursday night, Thursday day, or Friday day, Friday night. Okay, Wednesday to Thursday night is one day because that's... that's right, that's one day. That's the way they figure I'm sorry. Yeah, it's one day. Three days and three nights. It's early Sunday morning, he got up. See, the Jewish calendar is Sabbath Saturday. Right. It's about this Saturday, not and Sunday. It's from sundown to sundown is their day. That's right. Uh -huh. yeah. And so that's the three days and three nights. You can't get three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday. Good Friday to Easter Sunday is not three days and three nights. So that's, see, I mean, it's just foolishness. And yet people fall for it, oh my God. Because they no more read the Bible or believe the Bible or look at the Bible than they can fly. The Bible doesn't mean anything. It's what these men say. They're the ones that are going to tell me. And I'm not going to take any responsibility on my own. God forbid I would do that. God forbid I would study and learn anything. It's kind of like our educational system right now. Tell me who George Washington is, for God's sake. 
But Dad, you know what? The gospel to most religions and people is feel good. It's, it makes me feel good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I go to church on Sunday, I feel good. It kind of helps me through the week, even though I'm, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing, I'm sinning or whatever I'm doing. But it makes me feel good. The gospel is not a feel good. The gospel is about existence, about truth, how to live, how to, how to move and have our being in the truth of existence, how the Father is to. Does it bring me, can it bring me a good feeling? Absolutely. I feel good because I know I'm in him. Right. That helps me. But here's the deal. It's not about feeling good. It's not about emotion. It's about disciplining that emotion and understanding it's not, this isn't about emotion. This is about an understanding of how to exist and how to live and how to move. That's what this is about. And we have a feel-good gospel out there. We don't have a truth anymore. Nope. We have self-help books, self-help <laughs> preachers. That's what we have. And it's about feeling good, about feeling good about myself. Feel well said. That I can do yep. this, and I can feel good, and God is a part of my life. He's the center of my life. He's a big part of my life. No, he is my life. Amen. Yeah. He's my life. I have none if I don't have him. Amen. So that's my, that's my, that's true. See, Clark says it here again. He says that it doesn't say the just man does not or does commit sin. He doesn't say that. The just man commits sin, no, but simply that he may sin. And so our translators have rendered it in 1 Samuel 2.25, 1 Kings 8.31, 1 Kings 8.46, and 2 Chronicles 6.36. And the reader is requested to consult a note on 1 Kings here, where the proper construction uh, of this word may be found and the doctrine in question is fully considered. So, it, see, when you look at real Hebrew, when you translate it and you look at actual words, what they mean, you find sometimes that the King James translation is flawed. Sometimes it's on the money, but sometimes it's flawed. Not because they intended it to be, but as I say, we don't speak the King's English anymore. We don't say, thee, thou, thus, unless you're a Quaker. We don't use it. We don't use those terms. We don't use verily, verily. You've heard me give this example, you know, in the songs, you know, and the Lord directs my bark, he does safely keep. And I've asked congregations through the years, what's bark mean in that song? And the Lord directs my bark, he does safely keep. What's a bark? It's a ship. But most people, bark, and we just sing it, bark. Go on, go on. We don't think about it, you know. But then you stop one. I stopped one day and thought, what's a bark? <laughs> Singing a song. What is a bark? That sounds like a dog. <laughs> a bark. And I looked up the word, ship. And my ship, he does safely keep. My direction, my passage, keeps me. He calms the waters calms a storm because there's a storm around us all the time there's storms going on right now big time but he directs my ship and he does keep me safe amen anything else all right praise the lord okay thanks for watching today on food for life we do appreciate it god bless you we we really appreciate and enjoy our extended family. And we ask that the Lord bless you and keep you, keep you in strength and in health and keep your trust in Him. Do what is right before the Lord. Walk in Him. And one day we'll be saved. Amen? We'll be saved into eternal life. Praise God. Into an eternal city on an eternal planet that will last forever. Amen. We're going to walk in. We're just going to step into a day that lasts forever. Amen. Be no more time. No more nothing that way. No more tears. No more sorrow. No more grief. No more pain. No more sickness. Nothing like that. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. Come on back. Come on back Jesus. Come on back. Amen. Can't wait for that day. Praise the Lord. All right. God bless you. Remember always to do what? Give love and give life and give 
Jesus. Amen.